So thank you very much uh, for the invitation here. It's uh, a pleasure to see all the new countries and all the energy uh, we have here, because that's really missing in the rest of Europe, is the high energy to change things. And uh, you have taken your own history in your own hands, and hopefully we will see much, much more influence of the little countries in Europe, because innovation should not come only from the big ones, but from the smaller countries. And I belong to a country which is not even member of the EU, and we feel very comfortable, actually, to be not part of the EU, uh, because we think we have to be strong by innovation. And the whole idea which I'm going to talk about is called innovation beyond products. Because the biggest problem we have in innovation management is that we focus too much on products. And uh, Stefan said it before, you can have the best product if you can't deliver later on the value. If you can't reach your customers, it's worth nothing. Uh, but we still have this focus on product innovation. We love patents. The question is always, what do we do with the patents? So would you invest in this company, actually? Anybody would invest in this company? The firm dominates the market, the global market, with a market share of 40% and has outperformed all technology leaders. It brings up more products than anybody else, 80 per year. And actually, the young guys just love this company, this brand. Would you invest in this company? Would you? It looks fantastic, doesn't it? Lots of fresh new products. The young people love the company. Any idea which company this is? It's Nokia. So hopefully you did not invest in this company. Because that is the description of the, in 2007. And last year it was just 5% worth of what it was like just uh, seven years ago. So the traditional way of looking at innovation does not help us to see, um, see how you get killed by other innovations. Because Nokia focused on devices. They loved fresh new devices. That's the roadmap they had. But the big question is, how did they get killed? They were not killed by the traditional way of innovation. It was not more, better products. It was something totally different. One device killed Nokia. So what was the first reaction when Steve Jobs came out with this one device? What was the reaction of Nokia management? Then we have hundreds. Actually, we invited the smartphone. Because somewhere up here, I think, in 2001, we have the communicator. They had smartphones. And they said, we understand the market. But then somebody else came and said, like, no, no, we do it totally different. We bring out one device, and we update it only once a year, breaking radically the rules of the game. And Nokia had no idea what this was. Because what was the problem? Nokia had a mental model that innovation happens in products, devices. Is that a product, actually, we see here? Or a device? What is Apple? What did they invent? Customer experience. Customer experience. What else? Ecosystem. ecosystem. It's actually a, an access device to an ecosystem. A lot of people then invited uh, or uh, wrote applications. So innovation is a rather strange beast because it can come in very different forms. You can be the best in the old way of doing business, but suddenly somebody comes and does business totally different and you can't even understand what they are doing because it's strange. But again, then Samsung came into the market and is just doing what Nokia did before, just pushing out more and more products. That's just the sizes of Samsung um, smartphones, tablets, whatever you call it in the future. So now Apple, again, is under pressure with their traditional model of just bringing out one device each year. Will be interesting what the reaction of uh, Apple will be to fight these guys from Samsung. And it's very important. We focus always on products. I mean, I've seen outside there's a nice 3D printer. 
that's good. But the question is, what can we do with this printer? And these are all innovations here which totally failed because what is important is to understand, oops, why they failed. Apple failed with the Newton because they're overpromised. They said like, oh, we can understand handwriting. It didn't work. What happened was Palm, because Palm never promised actually that you can understand the handwriting, that you had to write a kind of strange new alphabet, and then Palm understood what you were writing. So it's not just bring out the product, it has to work. I mean, the Concord was a fantastic plane, but it was fast to go in three hours from London to New York, but it was by far too expensive. The economics lacked. So it's not just bringing out the products, but it has to be later on uh, adopted by customers. We always forget the customers in the, uh, in the innovation cycle. In particular, we still believe that we are in a time of scarcity where shops, so that's a shop, is a shop in Cuba, where there's no offering. So if you bring something to the market, people will absorb it, they will buy it. But we live in a market uh, today of abundance. There is everything out there. We have everything. We have hundreds of smartphones. We have choice. We have too much choice, actually. So if you start with innovation, with even bringing out more product, how, how in the world will a new product will be seen by customers if you just do more cookies, better cookies? You do more of the same. We call mutts. The question is, how can we do things totally different? What do you think about this idea? Would you dare to say this to your CEO? Well, I know we are in a commodity market where the price is key. You understand what a commodity market is? Usually it's oil, um, gas, things you don't really care for if it's from this gas station or for this gas station. And this guy believed, yes, I know we are in a commodity market where pr the price is key, but I believe that we can sell our commodity for 10 times as much. Would you dare to say this? I can sell oil for 10 times as much as my competitor. Would you dare to say this? Is anybody in the commodity business here? Probably nobody would dare to say this. I know who said this. Who said it? Gazprom. Gazprom. <laughs> <laughs> but Bobby Gazprom said also we have a monopoly and we have a pipeline and we close it. But uh, this is not a market. It's called Monopoly Game, and uh, I'm not going into politics here. <laughs> but of course, if you're dependent on gas from Russia, you don't have a very good uh, position to negotiate. But this is free will. This is a market. It's not forced upon you. Any idea which this is? What company this might be? I mean, when you look at the agenda, there's no break until lunch, right? No? Kind of, for me as a Swiss, kind of strange. Yes, we got very close to it. It's coffee. Because the question is, do we really need coffee beans? Because coffee beans is a commodity. And for a commodity, you're not willing to pay more than whatever the price is. If you do a little bit of branding, you can put it probably twice as much for the coffee bean, but that's it. But if you, if you really understand what people need, nobody needs coffee beans. Anybody here for beans? I mean, uh, anybody wants to have a co coffee bean here? Who would, is, who would love to have like a freshly brewed cup of coffee in the moment right now? Oh, thanks, not too many. <laughs> <laughs> yes, because it's totally different. If you sell the good, nobody needs them in the moment. What, what, what we do with the good, we need. And that's the reason why, uh, what uh, Nespresso did. They and said, like, let's sell the coffee cup and not anymore the beans. And they charge 10 times as much for this one of capsules than if you buy it by the kilogram. So innovation in the future is not about new products. It's about how do you stick out of the product. I call it the wow. And because who lately wowed because Samsung was bringing out a new TV set? Anybody knows Samsung's TV sets? They bring out every week actually a new one. Does it wow you? 
What was a company lately that wowed you positively? You said, like, what a fantastic company. Come on. Anybody wow, was wowed here by customers lately? Uh, by a company lately? With this life here is so boring. <laughs> Come on. Any great customer experience? Uh, related with coffee as well. Called Soy Express. Mm -hmm. What's special about them? That's a, that's a coffee made from soy. Milk. Okay. Yeah, that's a soy milk uh, with, uh, with a coffee. That's a kind of blended version. Okay. Any other wows you had lately? It's Gazprom. <laughs> it's a small uh, device uh, uh, which is used to hold the mobile phones uh, in the car. And okay. The company is Kendo. It's uh, from uh, United States, I guess. But the device is very simple, very easy to to buy it. You know, on the internet from any place in the world. Yeah, I like it. Easy to do business with. This is one of the success stories, actually, of uh, Amazon. It's so easy to spend money with them. Yeah, <laughs> you push the button. One-click shopping. Have you? Have you seen other e-commerce shops where it's really difficult to spend money? You know, have to register and to do this and this and this. Hey, make it easy to spend the money for your innovation. We always forget this. We always think the product is there. But there are so many little things which are important as well. Easy to spend money with you. It was fantastic. Lately, I went, wanted to buy a chil uh, ch uh, children book. And I wanted to support uh, my local uh, bookstore. So I went there. They had no idea about this uh, children book. So I said, OK, the name is this. It took them around five minutes to search in the computer system for this book. The only way how they found it was I showed it on my mobile phone on Amazon and said, I want this book. Once they had their, it found in their computer system, it took them another three minutes to get my address because they had to order it. At Amazon, I just had to push the button and it would have been delivered for free at my home. In this bookstore, I had to tell them which book I wanted. I had to tell them where to search and I had to give them my address again. That was very, very annoying as a customer. So it's not just the product, it's how you deliver the value in the end. It's very important. So what is the wow? And very important for innovation is you have to stick out of the crowd. If you just do what everybody else is doing, like the white dots, nobody will recognize you. If you're in the TV set business and you bring out new TV sets, that's your daily business. It's not innovation. It's daily business. So if everybody copies you and now is doing what you are doing, you have to find something else. You see, now the dot is white again. So innovation is never a game which is finished. It's a race. It's an ongoing race. But the best is you find a position with your customer where customers really love you and don't even see competition anymore. So the good part about Apple is, for example, either you're for or against Apple, but at least everybody has an opinion about Apple. And this is what great companies and great innovation is all about, is differentiation and customers that love you. Property, and we have boxes we think in, which are very traditional, what is innovation? Any idea? which uh, innovation expanded the global market for mobile communication the most. Why is it possible to use your mobile, com uh, mobile device in Somalia or Afghanistan? There's no government, but they have a mobile system. What I is the innovation that made that possible? Come on. What? Any idea? Phone. Satellite phones? Actually not. Yes, but good idea. Any other thing which made it possible that these guys all have, oops, some technology is not working. Cheap mobiles, actually they have uh, rather cheap ones, but if you go to some developed countries, they have all iPhones as well. So it's cheap is important, yes. But what made it possible that all these guys are happy here, except of one guy in the middle, you see him? He's the only one without a mobile phone. 
What made it possible that in Egypt, only 65% of the people can read, but 85% of the population has a mobile phone? Probably now it's 95%. Hmm? No, they pay. Connections, of course, but what made it possible that is it economically possible that they have a phone? You think it was donation? Yes, competition is very important, but important? music, leasing, no, actually they don't know the concept. We, because why is leasing not something in this country? Because you get very close to it. Because these guys, you want to sell a leasing contract to these guys here. <laughs> so, we know his name, right? He has a passport. It's a very sophisticated country. It's called Tanzania. They have a mail address as well. So you can send a bill. But what do they don't have? Do they have a banking system there? No, there's no banking system. Now they have a banking system based on mobile. It's called M-Pesa. Yeah, it's prepaid. Very simple, because now we think, oh, wow, yeah, that, it's, it's clear we need prepayment. But the traditional way how the uh, telephone companies looked at mobile market was writing bills, because billing is one of the core competencies of a large telco. I worked for a large telco, and we spent millions on billing. But you don't need billing. It's just we believe that we need billing. But once you understand that people can prepay particular bad customer segments like foreigners, people like these who ha don't have a credit history, suddenly are great customers. And suddenly a market which seemed to be rather uninteresting in emerging countries became an extremely interesting market. So prepaid was the solution. Actually, it was interesting. I wrote this already in my PhD in 2001 because it was so clear that suddenly you could open a market which was, un yeah, which was closed before. And The Economist last year wrote a whole article about the economic benefits of prepaid in Africa. Because now everybody can communicate and communication is so important. Can you imagine? What is for this guy here? Let's assume he's a sheep farmer. Without communication, what's his position to negotiate with the guy who buys the sheep? How good is his position? Very bad, because he has no transparency about the price. How much a, uh, a sheep is worth, probably, and, uh, in Saudi Arabia, where most sheep go to. Once he has a mobile phone, he gets one SMS, and the whole power level is changing in the, in the trading of sheep. They don't talk for hours on their mobile phones. But they don't do Facebooking. They just transport little information, which are extremely important. And communication changes the whole way of power. That's exactly what we see in Egypt in the last two years, how revolution could start because everybody has a mobile phone. Probably di dictators don't like mobile phones. But once they're there, you can't get rid of them. But classically, we think in technology, how many patents you have. It's important, but it's more important what you do it. The other classical innovation type is process innovation. Get products out faster. The assembly line, a fantastic uh, innovation, mass production. But now we're going to the next process. Uh, step. I think uh, Stefan talked about it and, and others will talk about it. The other thing we usually talk about innovation is new products and innovation. My per personal favorite is this one. Anybody who does not know which company is this? Yeah, Because what they do is a business model innovation. They really reconfigurate their growth engines or innovation engines and make a whole new business of it. It's not a new product. It's not a new distribution system. It's not new customer segments. It's not just a new value proposition. They really reconfigurate the whole industry. And later on, you will get to know the i-engines. Um, that's like what you work with. Because we need new ways to look at innovations. It can be customers, new customers. You're offering the traditional way how to design things. 
innovative channels, particularly when you're in a small country, it is very important, don't focus on your home country, because it's too small. You have to focus already very early globally. Think why Sweden, Switzerland, Netherlands are successful countries, because they are small countries and they have to export. And if you want to export, you have to be extremely good in a niche. You can never compete against Procter & Gamble worldwide because your home market is too small. But if you go for a niche, you can be world market leader from a small country. I think you can't be... That's the reason why I don't always, uh, like to look at American companies because American companies have huge home markets. So they can always go from the home market abroad. If you're in a small country, you always have to go global before you even go to your home market. Because the, your home market is too small. So if the, the advantage, for example, to be to to do to, to, uh, internet in Switzerland, for example, is we always have three, four languages already in the beginning. So our products, anything we design online is already multilingual because the country is already multilingual. That is a huge advantage if you go abroad. So look at some of the disadvantages you have, like several languages, and try to turn them into advantages. What's very important as well is we always believe w once we have an, an invention, we know exactly how to bring it to the market. Um, this is Hans Rausing. He invented the Tetra Pak system. Actually, he didn't invent the, or he didn't have the patent for putting paper together with aluminium foil to make these boxes. Any idea what his invention was? Any idea? The toy? What, what do you mean by toy? Could be, but mm, no, I, I haven't heard about it. <laughs> Okay, imagine you have this patent. What can you do with this patent? You have a product innovation now. You have this Tetra Pak. What can you do with this innovation? If you're really lazy, what do you do when you're lazy and you have a patent? Sell to others. Would you become a billionaire? No, yep, yeah, how you want to sell it. So you believe that you can license it out and then you get always a cash flow in, right? That's. <sighs> I don't think you become a billionaire. Because who would be a potential buyer of this patent? Like in that, this in the... Uh, set. Yeah, diary firms, exactly. But they're very happy with the traditional solution, right? They have glass bottles. What's the first thing they do with this patent? Right? Exactly. The only reason why they buy to get to keep it, out of, uh, keep it from away from the market is there a word in, uh, in your language to put it into a drawer? Okay, because in Swiss German we also have a word, in High German we don't. Schubladisieren, to put it, to drawerize something. Uh, okay. <laughs> exactly, that would happen with the, if, you, if you sell a patent. They would never go to the market. What else can you do? Okay, you have the patent. What can you sell to the diary firms? So, yes, but what is the benefit? But in the end, you need a physical product to move over to that person. Yeah, but in the end, what? Yes, absolutely, absolutely. But what do you sell? This all very philosophically. In the end, what's on your bill? Picketing solution. That's exactly what they did. But that was highly innovative um, because in the past, that was actually a machine company. They were producing packaging machines. They could have sold packaging machines. But that's exactly what you, you said. They sold, in the end, packaging services. So what's the advantage of selling packaged services? How is your cash flow developing when there's an economic crisis and you sell milk packaged or milk packaging? How is your revenue stream evolving? 
Might be cheaper. Yeah, that's a use case for the uh, for the diary firms. Yes. Yeah, but let's let's take the perspective of the company of Tetra Pak. What's the advantage of the business model to sell packaged services for your cash flow? Yes, very stable income. The best revenues you can have is recurring revenues. Once you have sold the, the, the contract, you get money every month. And how is the milk consumption changing over year, over the year? Not much, very stable, actually boring business. But boring cash flows, predictable cash flows are lovely. Yeah? You might be very rich early when you sell the patent. You might go to Thailand and have a nice island, but that's it. What's the disadvantage of that revenue model here? Hmm? Yes, a good pension, but yes, very generation. But what's the disadvantage from an investment perspective? Yes, it takes longer. Yes, the other disadvantage. Pardon? Yes, might be, but what's on the financial side the disadvantage of that business model? Stable. Yes, stable, that's the positive part. What's the, <laughs> what's the disadvantage? Yes, investment is highly capital in uh, in intensive. I mean, you have to produce the machines, you have to uh, buy and produce the uh, raw material, packaging material, you have to pre-finance everything. And SEB is not, you know, um, it's, a, it's a bank. You know, they want to earn money and they want to calculate the risk. They just don't give you the money away for free. So the financing part is a huge, huge problem in this business model. What sounds very good, stable recurring revenues, of course, has a downside when it comes to um, the investment part of the business. And this is what it makes so interesting. Innovation is not about products. It's how to bring products in the right way to the market and find the right spot sweet spot at customers who are willing then to pay uh, extra money for it. And we need new engines for innovation because that's beyond the product. Because the product and service does not create value in, uh, uh, in the beginning. First of all, you need a customer problem you solve. Nobody needs 3D printing machines. Nobody. What we can do with the prototypes we print out of it might be the interesting part. So if you're in 3D printing, look out for the problems you can solve much better than with the current solutions. But in the moment, everybody pushes 3D printers and we have these funny 3D objects nobody has a use case for. But once you go into prototyping for companies, you see a huge comp uh, potential there. It's not the technology, but what we do with the technology because there are customer problems out there you can solve. So your product, has to solve a customer problem, then your value proposition addresses that um, customer problem. And later, the, your business model delivers the value proposition, and the business model creates the value. Unfortunately, you have to go the whole way to create happy customers up here. Always people believe, oh, I got a product, we got happy customers. If you don't have deliveries or any channels, forget it. Unfortunately, you have to work this way. And the core is the value proposition being delivered by your business model. So what the hell is a business model? I think Patrick will also talk about this later on. A business model is very simple. It's two things. First of all, it's a building plan. It's like your DNA. You know everything about your DNA? No, you know nothing about it. But it explains how you work. It's the building blocks, how you create value. But very important is not only the building blocks, but the human aspect of your business. Why should your customers love your products? Why should the best people work for you? You asked, shall we go for the global market for people? The biggest question is, why should they move to Vilnius? Now, what is the good reason for people from Denmark to move to Vilnius? If you can solve that question, people will come. But if you don't address this, because it will not be money. You see, you don't go to Vilnius because of money. 
It must be more. You know, a nice place, you have great facilities for kids to go to school. You know, it's a little bit more complex. You need this heart also for the employee because people... <sighs> I don't know what your neighbor is saying to this uh, proposition, but uh, probably you can say the other way around as well. So, But you have to find a value proposition also for your people. Why should they work there? And give meaning is more important than money. And for any successful business, you have to answer four core questions. The first, first is, what excites your customers? That's the value proposition. The second is, how do you create uh, value for your customers? That's the fulfillment of the value proposition. How do you earn money? That's the revenue model. And who's in our team and what values do we pursue? Let's go a little bit to the value proposition. Most people think in products. So if they see a drilling machine, they believe they're in a power tool industry. If you produce screws and dowels, is that the correct pronunciation for this plastic part there? Dowels, because the rest of the world says dubel for it. They believe they're in the metal processing or in the plastic industry. But what is the customer really wants to do with a power tool? Screws and a dowel. What's the customer job he wants to solve? Yes, hang a picture over the wall, exactly. Because the customer does not think in products, he thinks in unsolved jobs. So it's very important, we do not need a drilling machine, screws and dolls, we need up to hang up a picture. We have to think about, when it comes to innovation, what is the job we solve for a customer. Customers hire a product or service to get a job done. And the product is just a mean to fulfill it. Because once the diary companies understood that the Tetra Pak is a much better product to fulfill their needs, they switched. Because what is really great about the Tetra Pak compared to milk bottles? Yeah, exactly. It's almost unbreakable. But which customer groups liked this unbreakable? Did the milkman really liked the idea of Tetra Pak? Because the milkman actually hated the Tetra Pak because it destroyed their delivery model and their relationship to the end customer. And the moms, they go to supermarkets. So Tetra Pak only worked with the advent of the um, supermarket. Because in supermarkets, moms and dads buy their milk. And they prefer to throw afterwards the package away and not bring it back. Of course, ecologically, it might be different. But of course, for moms and dads, it, it was much easier to make my life easier. So it's very important that you don't concentrate on your product, but focus your value proposition on the job to be done, because that's solution neutral. And let's go back to hang up the picture. What are potential solutions to hang up a picture? Drilling machine, dowel and screws. But the easiest way is hammer and the nail, right? or power strips. So suddenly, you see a lot more competitors where you, of course, have a different um, benefit. Because what's the advantage of a drilling machine compared to hammer and nail? It's very stable, but it's dirty, of course. Hammer and nail as much has the benefit of quick and dirty. And a very easy solution is also just hire some friend of yours who has a drilling machine. But sometimes you have the problem to get him out of the apartment again. Usually the last solution was the traditional way of for girls to solve that problem. But things are changing. You see, once you don't focus on your product, but at the value proposition and the job you solve, you see a lot of new potential competitors, but also much more use uh, cases for your product. So a good value, a good innovation starts with the value proposition. Who are your customers? What is the job you solve for your customer? And what is the benefit of it? And these are three of the engines you will later use in the uh, exercise for your own firms. And it's amazing. Once you understand, don't look at products, look at unsolved solutions. You see a lot of unsolved solutions, uh, unsolved jobs out there. Christmas is not too far away. Uh, was not too far away. It's just uh, two months, two and a half months. 
Was it easy to put your Christmas tree straight up? Was it easy? No? Who had, had no problems to put up the Christmas tree straight? You had no problem? Anybody had no problem to put the Christmas tree up straight? Because A pl plastic tree? It was a plastic tree? Because usually the guys who have no problems, they think like, what a stupid problem. We used to have a solution. And the solution is very simple. There was a German engineer who came up with this very, well, that is the problem, putting Christmas trees up straight. That's his job to be done. He invented the Krinner Christmas tree stand. Yeah, that's the reason why you don't have a problem. Right? Because that's the first time it's so simple. Because nobody thought that the market for Christmas tree stands is a huge market. Because most of you have inherited this old one and you take screws. And one is below the tree and then you screw it in. And the other person is holding it straight. But of course you can't hold a tree straight because you can see only one angle. And it is always <laughs> screwed. How does it, this work? You put the Christmas tree in. The other person looks from the other side, you push the button, that's it. Is it high tech? No. It's understanding there, that there was an unsolved job. Putting up Christmas trees straight. How many millions do you think that he sold? I think he's now in his 30 million. And you see what an Amazon review wrote about this. Simply awesome, saved my marriage. What an undull product that saved a marriage. So you can even put love to dull products if you really understand what he's doing. This guy is great because he was 60 when he invented it. He was a farmer and he had some other ideas um, like fixing something to the ground and he came up with the earth screw. Anybody knows what an earth screw is? Yeah, he came up with this idea. How simple this is. Because he didn't think in products, he thought in unsolved problems. And fixing something to the ground, usually you take a, a shovel, concrete, iron peak, and then put a fence on it. Hey, you can do things easier. And it's a huge market actually in uh, the Nordic countries to fix, for, or actually they went to foundations for summer houses. Because now you can screw it in and you unscrew it. So don't think about the product, but what is the job you solve for a customer? Then, of course, you have to fulfill it. Then you need a product. You have to distribute it. You have to create it. That's your process. You need your core capabilities. What do you want to do by yourself? And what are your partners? These are another three of your um, um, innovation engines. And take a look, for example, like here. They really change the processes, the channels, and everything at the same time. Innovation can start uh, at a lot of different things. I mean, how ridiculous it is that people have to bring it home, their, uh, their stuff. But the value proposition, of course, is instant satisfaction. You have it right now. You don't have to wait for it. So that was a great architectural innovation or channel innovation. Then, of course, you have to know where do you earn your money. Um, that's another innovation engine later on. A fantastic example is power by the hour. Um, the maintenance uh, for engines are actually being paid by the hour, how many hours you fly, and then you pay a maintenance fee on it. Airlines just love it because if the plane is moving, they get revenues in and then the costs are fine as well. Very important, most people forget, is the human aspect. Who are you, is on your team? And what are the values you share? Because probably in a pharmaceutical company, you work differently if you work here than in Basel. Because the Basel guys, they love big money. They don't like orphan drugs. They want to go for the big diseases of rich countries. Yeah, but a lot of people think there are more important com uh, uh, illnesses than fat, too much fat. Because we can make the world a better place if we focus not on the big markets, but in the relevant markets. Another great example 
is a Swiss company called Giberit. Anybody knows Giberit? Most men know it because they, you, when you take a P, you see it. Huh? What they do, they came from this very dull product. It's called a flush box. And they went to this fancy under-the-wall system. This is three times more expensive than this one. So the question is, why do people love this? Yeah, what's different? Huh? Unseeable. Yes, that's of course very important. But are you willing to spend three times as much, even like in a country like Egypt, where money is not available like hell? Yes. I mean, here, you've got a lot of square meters. And of course, they understood very quickly that all your, your rights, because, I mean, it looks nicer, things like this. But what is also uh, uh, important is that bathroom re in a, uh, renovation is a pain. So the faster you renovate the bathroom, the better it is. Because if you do the traditional way, it takes very long. And the other thing they understood was that it's not important to sell to the house owners, but to the plumbers. So the whole distribution was focused on plumbers. And they do everything. They have a great value proposition for the plumbers to make their life easier. And actually, in a lot of countries, you are not even able to buy anything except Giberit. Because plumbers just offer Giberit. Yeah, they have all their IT, their cut system, their everything is is. And actually, in countries where you don't have the, uh, the uh, traditional German uh, education system where you go, where you have an apprenticeship, they do the training. And once you are trained in Giberit, you will always do Giberit. Actually, we tried to get uh, non-Giberit in Switzerland. Impossible. And this is a great monopoly because you don't force your customers, like Gazprom, the people just love it because you said very good reasons why the house owners love it, but even the plumbers love it more. And they earn so much money on that. That's it from my side. Okay, thank you. Wait, 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 wait. This is... So innovation can start anywhere there. And in the afternoon, you will do the innovation engines. So really think about it where can your company take off later on in these four areas but in the end where is your engine you want to drive and the best innovation is which is focusing at least on one or two parts it's not just the offering do you have the right channels to put the offering there so really think about it and even more important is don't talk about it do the innovation game okay. thank you very much Thank you.